Since 2011, Musicbed has been changing how creatives license music. Their library is made up of more than 650 real indie musicians. From hip hop to classical compositions and everything in between, they have the perfect soundtrack for your next project. Visit musicbed.com for more. Hello. Norm? Yes. Hi, this is Jamie Derringer. How are you? Hi, Jamie. I'm fine. How are you? I'm good. I'm here with Amy Devers as well. Hi, Amy. Hi, Norm. It's like amazing to have you on the phone. Thank you. It's my pleasure. We're very excited. This is my first podcast, so... (laughs) Exciting! Hi, everyone. I'm Jamie. I'm Amy, and this is Clever. All right, you guys, hold on to your hand planes, because today we are talking to the one and only Norm Abram. Yep, you know Norm. He's America's most beloved contractor and woodworker. He's the shop teacher we wish we all had in junior high. He's the original lumber sexual. And before there was Normcore, there was Nomcore with his signature plaid shirt and work jeans. He's been the master carpenter for something like 37 years on PBS's long-running and highly acclaimed renovation series, This Old House. He was the new Yankee in PBS's popular woodworking show, New Yankee Workshop. And he's active in the movement to close the skills gap, helping to get young people the training and education they need to join the vocational trades and become the next generation of the skilled labor force. Plus, he's my personal DIY hero. He's as hands-on as they come, and he still has all of his fingers. (laughs) So let's (laughs) chat up Norm. My name is Norm Abram, and I live in the Boston, Massachusetts area. I'm the master carpenter for This Old House, the TV program, and a builder and woodworker as well. And I do this because I love it. I love the whole idea of working with wood and renovating houses and building new houses and anything that has to do with construction. I want to be there. (laughs) So you were born in Rhode Island and raised in Massachusetts. So what was your family dynamic like? Did you have siblings? What kind of kid were you? Well, we were a very small family. I had one sibling. I had a sister who was a couple years younger than I am. And unfortunately for her, she had some challenges because she lost her hearing very shortly after she was born, probably when she was one or two years old. No one seems to know the exact cause, except there was a possibility it might have been measles. So I didn't see a lot of her. She spent a lot of time in a boarding school in in the Massachusetts and Boston area where she learned lip reading and basically got an education which brought her from, you know, first grade to eighth grade. And then by that time, she was probably 15 years old because they'd spend two years in each grade of elementary school. I graduated from high school, and the year after that, my sister went to the same hearing high school that I went to and got her high school degree. And then she went on, and she has her own family now, and her children are, some are out of college, uh, one is still in college. So I didn't get to spend a lot of time with my sister, so I was kind of a loner. You know, I saw her on weekends. My father, you know, was always around. He worked very hard. We had a, you know, very simple life, but we had everything we needed. And because he was a carpenter and and a builder, I often would spend a lot of time with him, whether it be in the basement when he had brought home some material that he was using to build, say, a vanity for a project he was working on. He didn't have his own construction company, but he worked for remodelers and eventually custom builders and would end up being the leader or the lead man on a lot of these projects. And I love to play with everything mechanical. Um, You know, when I was young, I was into cars. We had a boat on the lake. I was into boats. I was into building. Uh, I was, you know, pretty well behaved, I think, for that era of time. My parents were certainly very strict. Um, But I was always very curious and spent a lot of time mostly fooling around with mechanical things, I guess. Tinkering from the get-go. Oh, yeah, absolutely. (laughs) Be down in the basement with my erector set, or I had a lot of other things that I would get at Christmas holidays, which would sort of fuel that. And a few months ago, last year, one of our magazine editors wanted to write an article about Pinewood Derby. And 
when I told him I actually still had my Pinewood Derby, he kind of flipped out. <laughs> and uh, so they ended up publishing a little picture of it in, in the magazine, and that was from the 1950s. Oh, wow. <laughs> That's amazing. Did you work on that Pinewood Derby with your dad? He would guide me, but he would certainly never do the work. You know, he would make sure that I was the one who would do it. And if he had any tips, he would certainly pass those along. But he was very patient with me as a young person. He, you know, was very disciplined and he, you know, gave me the time to do and learn things. And if I made a mistake, that was okay. But the lesson was, you know, try not to do that again. There was no punishment as such. It was just encouragement. And, you know, it doesn't get any better than that. That is a pretty fantastic way to get introduced to the mechanics of the world around you and how the built world comes together. I wish I had had a little bit more exposure to that as a kid. I definitely appreciated Legos. Those were my tools and toys of choice. But you also started working with your dad in the construction industry when you were old enough to do so, right? Uh, Even before it was legal. (laughs) (laughs) I remember the first time I went on a job site. I will never forget that day. He brought me to a job site where he was, at the time, laying down hardwood flooring, you know, typical oak flooring. And back then, we didn't have the privileges of pneumatic nailers. That was the old way. You installed it with cut nails. You used the cut nail to set the nail. I think we've even demonstrated that occasionally on this old house. And, you know, I was just there kind of helping him, and he let me drive a few nails. And I remember it was Christmas Eve because on the drive home, he said, what do you think you're going to get for Christmas? And I said, a bicycle. And, uh, and I was right. So the, the next day I got a bicycle. And that was sort of a solo visit. But when I, when I was 15, from the time I was 15 on till I left college, I worked every school vacation, every summer for the same company my father worked for, generally under him as the foreman of the job site. Uh, all through that period of time, you know, in the middle of the winter, all summer when it's 90 degrees, it didn't matter. Uh, that was the way I made enough money to put myself through school and also have some spending money to play around with. Looking back on it, what do you think that did for your father-son relationship? I know a lot of teenage boys who would have wanted to get as far away as they possibly could from any sort of authority. But, I mean, did that strengthen your bond? Did it help you develop a real deep respect for his skills and work ethic? Did it cause friction? Yeah, absolutely. You know, especially the, the respect of what he was doing for our family. You know, it was a, it was a job. It was, a, it was, you know, it was hard work, but satisfying work. But I, I guess I look back on it a little bit later, but I know we never had any conflict. And, and I know what you're saying about children who, you know, like, the last thing they want to do is work with their dad. <laughs> and I, I had two stepkids for a while, and uh, they're all adults now. And one, I couldn't get him to do anything. It was like if I told him to do something, he would find the most difficult way to do it, even though I had told him the easiest way to do it. <laughs> and I had another who actually worked for me for a few years, and, and he's just done wonderful in his own business. Um, he's almost 50 now, but he kind of took it in the same way I guess I took it in. And, you know, we had a pretty strong bond, but I think only after he retired and I was building the house that I'm in now, and he would come on weekends to help, did we really connect on issues, just personal stuff, you know, what it was like for him to have fought in World War II, you know, the Battle of the Bulge, all of that. I had never heard any of that during my childhood and, and adulthood until that time. And it was, it was really good for me in the long run because it was not too long after that that I lost my dad, but at least I had had the time to spend with him. I mean, sometimes he'd show up at my house site and we wouldn't get anything done for hours because he'd want to sort of talk and, and tell me you know, more about his life that I didn't know. And that even really gave me the opportunity to know him better than I had ever known him before. And, and that was the greatest part of the relationship. What a gift. Yeah, I think that some kids don't ever really have that, you know, those open and honest conversations with their parents or have any interest when they're teenagers of like knowing about their parents' lives. But it's only when you become an adult and you start thinking about, you know, having your own family or after you have kids and then really connecting with your parents on like an adult level and understanding where they come from. And that's always such a a wonderful experience, I think, for people. Yes, especially with that generation, too. You know, my father's generation, the greatest generation, they were always very quiet about 
anything that went on. They, they kept to themselves a lot. And I think for a lot of them, I can only speak for my father, I guess, but for a lot of them, that was not a good thing. But when they did bring themselves to, you know, reveal a little bit of what hurt or what was different and how it influenced them, I think it was a good thing for them. So that generation, a lot of people, I don't think they engaged with their children that way. I think they kind of kept it quiet. And I think sometimes to their fault, it may be, is that when they were questioned, they kind of pushed back when they probably could have made the relationship better had they sort of explained a little bit more. But, Mm -hmm. you know, everyone's different and everyone handles it in a different way. Mm -hmm. Well, it sounds like you had a really fruitful relationship with your father. And not only were you able to sort of learn and respect his trade and his skills, but you were able to respect where he was in, in context with the rest of society and how difficult and important it must have been for him to actually reveal his emotional side. And the other great thing about the fact that he helped, you know, with building my house is that I can look around this house and look at the work that he did. So, you know, there's always a piece of him here. So that really means more to me than anything else. That's wonderful. So when you went to Amherst, you studied mechanical engineering and business administration. What were your college years like? Did you, you know, still help your dad out or were you, you know, too busy with all of your studies? Were you really focused? I lived on campus, so I was away from home, Mm -hmm. except for, you know, winter break, spring break and the summertime. I did work all the summers and school vacations. And, you know, I went to the University of Massachusetts. And when I was a freshman in college, I went in as a 17 year old because that's just the way my birthday fell. So I was the younger side of the group. And, you know, it was a very controversial time in history uh, with Vietnam and everything that was going on. So there was a lot of potential distraction, I I might say, on campus. And being in mechanical engineering, which is what I wanted to start out in, uh, that was interesting. But I quickly found out that there were certain aspects of it that I didn't find sort of inspirational enough for me to stick with it in the long run. I liked the hands-on things where we would do shop work and work with metals and learn things that I hadn't ever done before. But when it came to sitting in a classroom with 300 other students in thermodynamics, it was like I didn't really enjoy it. And so, of course, the thing about that generation of parents also is they wanted you to go to college. They felt it was the best thing for you to do. And so I was terrified to tell my parents this was not the right choice for me. But eventually I did, and uh, however, I didn't leave school, I decided that, well, if I'm going to someday have a construction business, which was in the back of my mind, why not switch over to the business side of the campus and learn accounting and marketing and some skills and knowledge of how you run an actual business? And it was funny because a lot of business programs and classes deal with environments which can be totally controlled, like in a factory where lighting makes a difference, the atmosphere makes a difference in your production levels and things like that. But on a construction site, that doesn't exist, especially if you live in New England. (laughs) It's changing all the time, and and people think we don't work all year round, yet we do. (laughs) And I've been in the snow and scraping ice off of two-by-fours and done all of that, so I know exactly what it feels like. And so I didn't get any educational value out of what I was learning there in terms of that. But I did get enough that within a few years after I left school that I started my own business. And so I think that was the valuable thing I got out of the university. I made good friends. Uh, In fact, I was just going to walk away and just go back into building. And one of my best friends said, no, don't don't leave school now. You know, he said, stay for it and, you know, get some more education. And And I did, and and thanks to them, I didn't walk away. And because of them, I gained a little more knowledge, which I guess theoretically maybe made it a little bit easier for me to run my business when I had it going. Yes, I think there's a trend now in education to run MBAs concurrently with MFAs, and I think it's brilliant. I think anyone who plans to go into a trade or into the design or art field has to be prepared to be their own business person. And so getting that kind of training can be just enough of the insurance you need to feel like I can go out on my own and I can make it work. Because you were running your own construction company 
Well, you you worked for a multi million dollar development company as a as a site supervisor at first, right? First few years I worked in the industry, I I was actually I found a ad on a bulletin board at the university for this startup company in Cambridge, Mass, which was made up of three people who had graduated from uh, MIT and one from Harvard. The three MIT guys were sort of on the architectural side, and the Harvard graduate was more on the business side. And they joined together and started a company. Their idea was to hire a lot of unskilled people, actually, because they came up with a building plan, which was sort of semi prefabrication right on the job site. Uh, That doesn't really exist today, but it was something new at the time, and they had a good idea, and it didn't quite work out as well as I thought. I think they thought it was going to work out because of materials and so forth, but I started with them as a carpenter, and then the the foreman was going to be going back to school. He was an MIT student, so I got his job. I became foreman, and eventually I became Site supervisor, there was sort of two positions. One was in charge of all the subcontractors, and one was in charge of anything that had to do with the structural building of, the, of each thing. It was, there was student housing, there were condominiums. And so I went through that level for several different projects of being a supervisor. And then they wanted me to go into Boston and sort of be the manager of supervisors and other jobs. And I didn't want to do that. I love working in the field. And I said, I don't want to be in an office. I want to be in the field. And if I'm in a trailer and I have a little office and I'm running a construction site, that's where I want to be. Mm -hmm. And so that's when I sprung out and went on my own. A guy that I had hired on one of the projects, we became good friends and we started the, the first business, which was called Integrated Structures. Actually, your transition into working for this old house must have come at Sometime around that time, right? And and you've kind of fell into that opportunity. And I'd love for you to tell that story. <laughs> I certainly did fall into it. <laughs> say that. Yeah, I, I had my partnership. We we the first job we did was a pretty good sized commercial job on the island of Nantucket. We built a store, and I had met this architect, Jock Gifford, and he started you know sending me some business. And I was building a house for him on the island of Nantucket, and. Russell Morash, who is the genius who created, you know, This Old House and Victory Garden, Julia Child, Ask This Old House, those are all his shows. And he was introduced to me by Jock Gifford, the architect, and he asked me if I was interested in building a small sort of garage workshop on his property on the mainland. And I said, well, when I finish this, sure, I'll, I'll take a look at it. So I gave him a rough price, and he agreed to it. So I went to the Morash property, and he had already put the foundation in, and I started building this shop and uh, garden shed and so forth. He was an avid gardener, which was why he made the Victory Garden Show. (laughs) And um, one day he came up to me and he said, you know, I'm thinking about doing a TV show about renovating old houses. Are you interested? And I and I had to stop myself. And in my head, I'm thinking, I know you work for a living. I think you're a TV producer. <laughs> I have no idea what a TV producer and a director does. So I, I don't quite get this. And I, I have enough work on my plate right now. I, I'm not sure. Short story is eventually he approached me again. He brought me over to the first This Old House project in Dorchester, Massachusetts, where he had already selected Bob Vila to be the host of the show. And he was basically looking for tradespeople to help with this project. It was a low budget, shot in the dark, 13 episode program he was gonna put together to see if people would be interested in learning how to renovate their houses, or at least learn something. And I looked at some of the work that had been started by some other folks, and I, it just wasn't up to what I would wanna try to do. and I sort of said, you know, I don't know if this is for me. And he said, why? And I said, well, you know, if I were doing this, I'd do it a little bit differently. And I think I can give you a slightly better quality of work. And so he he didn't hire me to work on television, but he hired me to be part of this group of, I call us the group of gypsies that were put together. None of us knew each other. We were just kind of thrown together by Russ and we were going to renovate this project in three months and, and he was going to make a TV show. I went home and sort of joked with my 
family that I might be on TV, you know, you'll see me carrying a ladder through the background. <laughs> and, and I was serious. I had no idea I was ever going to be on TV. I mean, he wasn't hiring me for that. And uh, he also said he hired me that when he first saw the house I was working on in Nantucket, he said that I had the smallest scrap pile he had ever seen. And that, for some reason, really impressed him, I guess, because he didn't want any waste mm. <laughs> as part of the job. Well, it demonstrates a, a tremendous ability to plan and be efficient and maximize your materials. That's all signs of good workmanship. And that all came from my father. So it goes right back, you know, to where it started. Uh, so Russ said, well, you know, we, if you don't have enough work, and you, I said, yeah, it's slow right now. It's February. We're going to do this project. And I said, okay, I'll come on board and we'll do some work. And one day, he, I think it was the second, was the second show that he made for this old house, he told the audio person to put a mic on me and he told me, you're going to go up on the scaffolding and Bob's going to go up there and meet you and you're going to talk about what happened on the eaves, why it happened, how you're going to fix it, how long it's going to take, and how much you think it's going to cost. And that was the beginning of it. And frankly, the rest of it is history. <laughs> Who ever saw it? That, that this thing would still be going on 37 years later. And even, even Russ, after that first series, when I left, he said, and I don't know if this is going to work. I'll call you if something comes up. And six months later, he calls me and says, let's go look at this project. I want to get your opinion on it. And we were off and running. Yeah, I feel like this old house is probably like head to head with Sesame Street as like the longest running show in the history of TV shows. And for me, like personally, it was my first touch point with design, even though like it's, it was more than that. So, you know, I think somewhere deep down inside this old house was probably the spark that lit the fire for me to just be interested in furniture and design and architecture and how things are made. Mm -hmm. Exactly. I mean, it was, it was way ahead of its time. You know, there were no, TV shows that were anything like it. Uh, HDTV didn't exist. DIY didn't exist. And, you know, Russ got his Lifetime Emmy a couple years ago, and I was lucky enough to present it to him. And, and what I said about him was that he took things that he personally loved to do, uh, or he loved. He loved great food. His wife, Marion, was a professional chef. He loves the garden. He's still an avid gardener. He renovated on his own house. He came from a family that did that kind of work. He's an amateur woodworker. He was right, making shows and not only teaching the public, but he was teaching himself. So his interest in craftsmanship and the trades was really true. And the fact that he turned them into TV shows was brilliant. You look at him and you say, now there's a guy who decided on what he was going to do and didn't regret one single day of the 30 years, 30, 40 years that he was working on these shows. It, it's just amazing. You know, I had the, the pleasure of meeting him. And I have to say, he's one of the most impressive individuals I've ever encountered. Just so passionate and so engaged. And what I think really, really worked about this old house and still does is that it understood authenticity when everybody else was just trying to find out what was hip or cool and market to you. And it's never really pretended to be anything other than what it is. And that through line means that everyone feels like they know you, they know the rest of the cast. They feel like it's really trustworthy. You're not trying to add any false jeopardy or create any gimmicks just to make it entertaining. And I'm pretty sure Russell Mora also had a very keen sense of how to do this thing in a really lean and agile and cost-effective way so that it's sustainable. And as far as TV making goes, he just really blows my mind. <laughs> You're absolutely right about getting this done with a minimal crew, you know, a small amount of equipment. There was no scripting of those shows. It was all made up on the site. He had the flexibility to change scenes if he saw something else going on on the site. And his whole point of view was, you know, a biggest part of it was to respect craftsmanship. And he put together... Everyone who got put together in that cast, one way or another, he had a connection to them, whether it be direct or slightly indirect. He just knew who he wanted to do the work. He wanted real people doing the work. And what he was able to accomplish, and we've been able to accomplish, is that we kept true to our mission, which was to 
tell it how it is, do it the best possible way we can do it, and try to educate people. When I first went to builders' shows, I would get criticized. People, you'd be riding on the bus from the convention center back to your hotel, and contractors would be saying, what are you doing? You're giving away all the secrets. <laughs> <laughs> and I would just say, are you insecure? <laughs> Believe me, there are plenty of people out there who have no interest in doing any of this work, and you'll have plenty of work. But there are a lot of people out there that like to understand better what you do. So rather than hide everything from them, let's give them the language, mm -hmm. the process. And, and that, was, you know, that was driven by Russ. If he had a guest and he said, well, why do you do that? They'd say, I, I don't know, I just do it that way. That was not sufficient. You know, there had to be a logical explanation because that's what we wanted to get and he wanted to get to the viewers. And you're right about the cast. I love working with those guys. I mean, I, it's like we're family and it, and it shows. And um, you couldn't work with a better group of people, yeah. including all our staff. You know, when you think about single camera shoots, you know, an audio guy, a camera, a PA, a grip and talent and a producer and a director who's also the executive producer, all, <laughs> all in one little small package. And the, the amount of TV that he produced, I mean, one day it was This Old House, next day it was Victory Garden, next day it was New Yankee Workshop, you know, and, and we all had fun. I'm glad to know you guys are having fun because it is hard work, but you, you mentioned earlier about how satisfying it is. And at the end of the day, you have a real tangible sense of accomplishment that not only puts shelter over, you know, people's heads, which is really important, but also educates the general public. And you're right, you're giving them the language, helping demystify the process so that they can take more control over their own shelter, which is really important. Well, I think too, it's like when people see how things are done and realize the amount of work that goes into it or how much thought is put into it, they appreciate it more. Um, oh, yeah. It's not about giving away secrets so much as it is about demonstrating the importance of things being done correctly and, and properly, and then having an appreciation for someone who has the skills to do that. Right. And I think we need more of that these days, frankly. I think that's part of the problem that we have now and that we're not drawing enough young people into the trades. You know, part of it is public perception of the trades. Part of it is the education system got a little messed up when they took all the trade exposure out of the schools. And from my perspective, if a young person doesn't have an opportunity to experience something at all, they're never going to know if they like it. And education is important. There's no doubt about it. But not everyone's, you know, meant to get a four-year degree. But even if you want to be a carpenter these days, you've got to get some education. You've got to get some field experience. And until we sort of bring back the value, as you said, these are the people who build our houses and repair our houses and do our plumbing and electrical. There has to be more respect. And I always try to tell people in general, if you have a contractor working in your house and you respect them, you treat them well, you don't treat them like second-class citizens, they will do a tremendous job for you. Well, I hear stories all the time. Even if I bring someone to my house to do something that I don't do, typically, you know, I might not do plumbing. Well, you, you welcome that person to your house. You treat them as, as professionals, and they go out of their way to do a job. But as soon as it's like, you can't walk in my house because, you know, I just don't want you to do that, it kind of sends the wrong message. And sure, there are people that probably deserve to be treated that way, but for the most part... That's what we would like to help to do with our next generation initiative is change the public perception and give people an opportunity to experience the crafts or the trades and learn them and realize that they can be very satisfying. Okay, we've got to take a quick break, but we'll be right back with more Norm in just a minute. This quick break is brought to you by our friends at Musicbed. Indie folk rock artists Bronze Radio Return are now a part of Musicbed's roster of great artists. You can license music from their full discography for your film projects, including great songs like this one, Blurry-Eyed Worries. Right now, Musicbed is offering 20% off your next online purchase. Just enter promo code CLEVER when you check out on musicbed.com. Before we 
kind of delve deeper into the value of the trades, why don't you give us the overview of the Generation Next initiative? Right. Well, this is something that Eric Dorkelson, our president, had started to, he had been thinking about for many years. And it's something that we wanted to get out there and felt that in talking to contractors these days, you ask them what their biggest problem is and they say, help. I can't find help. I can't find good help. I can't find dependable help. And then when you look at the statistics and you say, wow, there's, you know, 3 million, there's going to be possibly 7 million jobs in the next 10 years or so in the construction industry that are going to go unfilled, you really start to say, there's a real problem here. And, and how did we get here? Mm-hmm. So it's not so much about how we got here. It's how we're going to get out of here um, yeah. from the mission on our side. It's, it's to empower young people. It's to ex- explore, give them the opportunity to learn the skilled trades because if we don't do that, the, the majority of skilled tradesmen now are reaching retirement age. And once they're gone, we lose all our mentoring capability. Right. So we got to get people who have some interest in that, getting some exposure and get, giving them some help in order to, to get the education that they're going to need. So part of our mission on Generation Next is to raise money. And we are working with Mike Rowe and MicroWorks Foundation. And we just gave him a check for half a million dollars at the IBS and Kitchen and Bath show in January. That went into his foundation. We got a bunch of charter vendors, sponsors who were there when we presented him the check. And if people are interested in what that money is doing, you can go to his website, microworks.com, and you can find out how you apply for a possible scholarship for this old house, the TV show, we are going to launch a nationwide search to get three apprentices. It's going to depend on the applicants, whether it's plumber, electrician, landscaper, carpenter, certainly at the top of the list. But depending on the applications that come in, three of them will be selected. We are going to buy the house that we're going to renovate in next season series. We'll renovate it ourselves. We'll bring in sponsors. And these three apprentices who get selected will work on the job site for 10 weeks. They will be brought to New England. They will be provided with some kind of a stipend and some housing, and they will work alongside the cast of this old house to get more educated in that specific trade. And we'll put that across all platforms, so the magazine, the website, as well as the TV show, and hopefully those shows will bring some inspiration. We've already spent a fair amount of time with the magazine profiling different people around the country that we've found. And you, if you start poking around a little bit, you start to hear stories about people who might have started out in completely different careers and they got a lot of debt <laughs> from college <laughs> mm-hmm. and they're having a tough time finding a job. And some of them are sort of taking a a chance in getting into the construction industry, and, and they're liking it. So between, you know, hands are the things we really need. I know there's, a, there's more people I've seen recently who are interested in the construction trades, but they want to be on the management side. We, we need to deal with that, which I think is less of a problem. However, when I talk about managers, I always say the best managers, like a great architect, or any of the design areas, if they've experienced the craft itself, they are much better at it. They understand the process better. And so you have to have that. You know, it's, it's, it's imperative. I agree. We want to have that part of it inspire people, make them understand that it's not a slam dunk, that you learn these trades in a short period of time. No, you have to start from the beginning. We all started from the beginning. Tommy started from the beginning. Richard started from the beginning. Roger started from the beginning. I started from the beginning. And it's a journey. And people have to understand how rewarding that journey can be. And I did a little segment with Charlie Silva on this old house where we solved the problem. And at the end of it, we said, you know, this is, this is what it's all about. You know, we see a problem. We use our minds to figure out how we're going to do the problem. And we use our hands to actually execute the solution. And when you look at it in the end and see that you've got it done, it doesn't get any better than that. But you've got to go through that process. And I think 
we have to change the student, you know, their feelings as well, because too many contractors tell me they get students who are in and then they, they kind of have an attitude that they've learned it all. And part of that has to be solved by the people they're working with. So sometimes the old generation can be a little tough on the young guys. <laughs> so I think they have to back off a little bit, but they, they got to do it in a way my father did it, which is like, yeah, you made a mistake, but you learned from it, right? <laughs> And I even used to tell my, my workers, I would say, don't be afraid to ask me a question because I would rather have you ask me a question if you don't understand what I want you to do so that I can explain it to you in a better way. And I can't tell you how many times with your carpenter's pencil, you're drawing on a piece of plywood to show one of your workers how you want something put together and, and what the sequence is. And, you know, ask me if you don't know what I want you to do and everything will be fine. However, if you make a mistake that weren't paying enough attention to what was going on, you, you shouldn't make it a second time. You know, you sort of, this isn't three strikes, you're out, you're out because on my side of it, I'm running a business. So I have to be a little bit tough about making the same mistake twice. But I'm more than willing to answer your questions and guide you through the process. And that's the learning part of being in the trade. Unfortunately, a lot of Contractors feel like, well, they don't have the time to do that because they're trying to run the business. Yeah, but that's investment. That's right. You're exactly right. That's the investment, and they, they do have to learn. And I think more of them are. And I'm seeing kind of a insurgence of everybody's finally seeing the problem. And, you know, schools are starting to bring things back. The vocational trades are starting to get more attention. The local Building associations are saying, we've got a problem. We better start working on it. At the Builders Show and the Kitchen Bath Show in Orlando this year, that was the talk of the show. We've got to do something about this problem. And so now we've got industry getting into it. And industry is helping certainly support our generation next. And we hope that that inspires companies to just keep jumping into the group and participating with us. I talked a little bit at the Builders Show, and I said to the crowd, I said, you know, it's amazing to walk this show. I've walked it every year for the last 20 years, it seems like, and I see all this innovation and these new products, and they're great. But what scares me is that we don't have enough people who know how to deal with these products. They, know, they don't know how to install these products correctly. You know, we need to educate them. We need to find them. We need to bring them into the fold. And I think there's so many young people that get pushed into a formal four-year education. My brother's generation, which are more millennial, the college thing was like shoved down their throat. Like you have to go to a four-year college and get a degree or nobody's ever going to hire you. And I think that definitely does a disservice because some people like they just don't need to go to college. They have a great talent or a great skill that they could learn and they're, they're going to be just fine and they don't necessarily need the degree. So you really need to focus on what's best for that person. And in my case, I went to four year college and I got a graduate degree in furniture design and construction. So I feel like I would have really benefited from having a shop class in high school or something that where I could have, you know, really satisfied those urges earlier mm -hmm. on. And I love my college education in terms of building things. But I think what we don't understand when we push people into knowledge work is that we're robbing them of a sense of a real tangible kind of accomplishment, a real concrete measure of what they got done in a day. And we're assigning them to a world of arbitrary promotions and number crunching that doesn't really register on a deep level sometimes about what kind of impact you made on the world. Mm -hmm. Right. And we don't want these kids sitting on the, on the sideline or these young adults sitting on the sideline feeling like if they head into a trade that they're going to be um, you know, somewhat mistreated or not respected for what they do. And that's where the, the public perception comes in. But I had the best thing that I heard uh, last year was my wife and I, we were at an art opening for a friend of ours. And this woman walked in and she said, you're, you're Norm Abram from this old house. I said, yes. She said, I have to tell you a story. My son started watching this old house when he was like nine years old. He loves this old house. And he is now a contractor in the local area. He has his own little website, and we actually we featured him as one of the profiles in our magazine. He's doing this work. So I said, oh, that's, that's terrific. I said, I need to get his name, 
his phone number, his email address, because we'll have one of our staff do a pre-interview with him because he's just the kind of person I'm looking for to feature on this initiative that we're trying to do to inspire other people that this can be done and it can be a very rewarding job, not only, you know, for your, your own well-being, but from a financial point of view as well. He said, well, I want to tell you a little bit more. She said, one day he came up to me, he was a young teenager, and he said, Mom, is there anything you'd like us to do in the house that, you know, you would really like to have? And um, she said, well, you know, I'd like to have a sliding glass door off the kitchen area, the dining area. And he goes, oh, I, I can do that. And so he went ahead and actually did it. I guess he got some help from his dad, but his dad really wasn't very knowledgeable in construction, but he actually got it done. And I said to her, the thing I said to her, which I think more parents should be doing, is I said, congratulations to you for letting your son follow a path that he wanted, not the one that you wanted. Mm-hmm. Yep. And that's what we got to drive into parents' heads. Look, don't pigeonhole your kids into thinking they're going to be a failure if they don't get a four-year degree. I went to the University of Massachusetts for five years. I do not have a degree, but I have a heck of a job, and I love what I do. Mm-hmm. And I'm able to, through the TV show, which was a total fluke and piece of luck that it all happened, but I get to at least share some of what I know with the public, and the public response has always been great about this old house. I think, too, exposure, as you mentioned, is really important in changing the public's perception, and that's not only exposing the parents, but also exposing the kids. Like you said, Amy, having a shop class in high school or having you know any kind of design or um, anything related to that in high school would be amazing. And even earlier than that, just exposing younger kids to the idea of like, oh, you like building with Legos? Well, guess what? Maybe you could do this job. I think you're absolutely right about going younger because I think we already missed the whole generation that kind of got at bypassed. So I, I, I'm saying, people are saying we need high school. I'm saying grammar school. And you talk about something simple. I'm on the, I'm on the board of directors of Old Sturbridge Village. And I don't know how much you know about it, but it's one of the best living history museums in the country, in uh, Sturbridge, Massachusetts. And we have interpreters who re- represent the period of 1830 and historic houses like you wouldn't believe. But we don't have a woodworking shop. So we're now trying to put up a small exhibit, and the, the long-term goal is going to be to actually get a woodworking shop like the blacksmith shop, like the pottery shop. It actually runs and functions. And as we were thinking about it, you know, wouldn't it be great if all we did, and maybe just on weekends, if all we did is set up a little workshop area, brought in some pieces of wood, brought in a plane or a chisel or something, you know, a simple tool that any young person could at least try at, and just let them you know, run a a molding plane over the edge of a piece of wood, you know, wouldn't that be great? I mean, because kids love to do that. And just to give them that little bit of exposure. Yeah. Not everybody's going to like it, but for my money, you know, if, if it's two out of 10 that even have a glimpse of saying, you know, this is kind of fun, then I think we've, you know, we've started to do our job. You've demystified it and planted a seed, which I think is important. We had a a guest who's a designer maker, um, Brendan Ravenhill, who conducts a boat building workshop for kids every summer. And these are young kids, like seven and eight years old. And he had the cutest observation, which is that young girls tend to be way better at hand planing than young boys, (laughs) which is, I think, just speaks to like the different ways that kids develop, the young girls tend to have like a little more patience um, at that point and boys try and, you know, make it work with brute strength. But even just that kind of exposure means when it comes around again, maybe in junior high school, you're less likely to shy away from it because it's not a scary unknown thing to you at that point. You know, and, and the other point you bring up too is it's, it's, it's you know, it's about men and women. Um, There's more women getting interested in in different aspects of the skilled trades, and they do the job really well. We have a very close friend whose daughter's partner is, uh, she's um, actually learned uh, timber framing, and we'll probably try to do a profile about her and say, you know, why did you get into this? Why do you love it? Because I started thinking about this recently. I said, you know, when you talk to your kids as an adult, you talk to them as children, the last thing they want to listen to is you. (laughs) <laughs> but 
Sometimes a friend can say the exact same thing you said as an adult, and they'll listen to them. Yep. So my thinking is, you know, if it comes from a 67-year-old like me, maybe it's even better if it comes from, you know, a 20-year-old who can say, look, I, I decided to give this a try, and I didn't think it was going to be like this, but I, I'm really happy doing this, and I, it's rewarding. So I think if everybody does their role, hopefully we'll get a few more people in. We have to. <laughs> I guess it's not, it's not a chance of hoping. We, we have to get people in. Well, good luck to you guys on that initiative. I think it's really important. And so we, we want to support you any way we can. But I do want to bring the conversation back around uh, to you, Norm. We want to talk about your creative process a little bit. I know that you love to solve a problem and solving a problem involves both your head and your hands. But I want to know, like, talk us through it. Are you are you the careful planner kind? Do you create samples? Are you intuitive and on the fly? Are you a crazy risk taker? Like, I don't know if this is going to work, but let's just give it a shot. I think I'm all of those things together. <laughs> Probably more of a careful planner than anything else, especially when I was doing the New Yankee Workshop show because we were making a TV show that would be done mostly over a period of about two days with maybe a break day in between, build a furniture project. And there was a lot that had to happen before that, and there was a lot that had to happen after it. So before it, thanks to Russ and his brilliant idea of you know going to museums and private collections and looking at pieces of furniture that might not even be signed. I mean, my best influence comes from the unknown woodworker. I love looking at pieces of furniture that are not signed and just saying, huh, I wonder how they did this. Or I wonder what he, what he was like or she was like. You know, you, you look at these pieces, it's beautiful. And I wasn't trying to replicate everything. It was just to study them and build things that were better than the types of woodworking projects that were available in magazines at the time. There wasn't a lot of, you know, decent furniture projects being done. It was pretty simple types of things that we felt weren't teaching the people enough of how to use the tools and so forth. So that had planning and that I would do a lot of sketches and I'd make up material lists and I would actually build a prototype, which I didn't have to do, but it helped in the TV production side because it would allow me to figure out how much time it's going to take to actually do this. And sometimes I would change a technique that I did on the prototype, I'd do it slightly differently on the project itself that we shot for the show. So there were some changes that might be made along the way. But at other times, when I'm not doing TV, I think when I run into a a problem, whether it be for woodworking or just general carpentry or playing around with a car or a boat, it's it's just intuitive. You know, this this just broke. I don't know anything about it, but I'm going to try to fix it. So I do a little bit about that. And as far as being a crazy risk taker, I don't, I don't know. I guess I've had an opportunity to do some, some things that I never thought I would be able to do because, of, because I do the TV show. You get exposure and you get invited to do things you never thought you would do. But I guess overall, uh, I, I keep my risk level pretty low. I'm pretty, pretty low key. I'm with you. I'd rather plan it through a few times and try and anticipate where the issues could be so that I can do it right the first time. I'm fine with fixing mistakes. I think that's a really important skill to learn, but I'd rather not spend most of my time fixing mistakes. I'd rather spend most of my time figuring out how to avoid them. When I knew what I was going to build and I had it in my head, when I was building, when I was a contractor building and I had a job to do with a client, whether it was an addition or a new house, when I was doing my material list, I would build that whole house in my head yeah. from start to finish as I was making the materials list. And I think that's why I ended up getting the quote from Russ saying I had the smallest scrap pile. <laughs> and the same thing was true in the New Yankee Workshop is that I'm focused on what I'm doing, but I also know what comes next. I don't work doing, okay, I finished this. What do I do next? I'm already in the next phase on where I am at the moment. So I'm a little bit ahead of it, but not not too far ahead that I lose focus on it, my approach for the most part. I feel like it sounds so much like you, Amy. That's exactly what you do, too. (laughs) Yeah, pretty much. So I want to know, you love carpentry, you love building furniture, woodworking, working with your hands. Is there anything that you absolutely hate doing or you're just like, I wish I didn't have to do this part? Up until a while ago, there was really not anything that I hated doing. But I think as you get older, there's a couple that kind of creep in. <laughs> and now, at my age that I'm at now, I hate doing demolition. I used to love doing demolition because you could get all your frustrations out. 
But now I don't like doing demolition. It's too dirty. It's I don't know. Maybe I'm becoming a wimp, but <laughs> <laughs> I, I don't like I don't like demolition. And as I look out my window, as we're getting blasted with snow today, I'm not looking forward to going out and cleaning up the snow because I have a pretty big driveway. <laughs> but um, other than that, I I like to be challenged more than anything else. I sort of live my life looking for challenges. I can see that. And I like to think that your distaste for demolition now has more to do with your lack of frustrations that you need to get out than anything. That's my psychological assessment. I mean, I've always been pretty comfortable as to who I am, I guess. You know, when you're younger, you're always questioning yourself, I think. But as you get older, you start to say, well, some things are not important and some things are. And you make the choices. And Yeah. Mm -hmm. I don't look back very far. I'll tell you that. I (laughs) <laughs> I, I'm one person I got to meet a couple times, and sometimes I compare myself to her, is that Julia Child was just like that. She was an amazing person. She taught the world a lot, and when she made a decision to do something, she never looked back, and, and I kind of feel the same way. I mean, in my life, going down the road, every time I came to a fork that I had to make a decision, I've never looked back and said, I wish I went the other way. That's pretty powerful. I've definitely gone the wrong way on a few forks. Well, I won't say sometimes it ended up being that, but at least, uh, at least you know, I didn't have to go back. Well, yeah, <laughs> just a detour. Bringing it back to building furniture and carpentry, woodworking, etc. Are there any non-woodworking activities that you enjoy doing? I'm a boater. I'm a serious boater, not a sailboater. I'm a power boater. I grew up with small lake power boats, and I I do coastal cruising now in a power boat. I love doing it. I, it was a new skill to learn that I picked up oh, about 15 years ago or so. And I love the challenge to learn something new. I get to respect the power of nature even more because when you're on the ocean and you run into tough going, you learn a lot. And as I once said, and my wife said, are you sure you want to say that? Uh, once on one of my interviews, I said, well, it's kind of like my therapy. It's better than sitting in a wall paneled room telling somebody why you're not happy or something, you know. <laughs> and it, it, it's my therapy. It, it takes me away from everything else, and it just lets me relax most of the time. Only when you're in rough seas do you not feel relaxed. It's very special to be on the water. I've always loved being on the water, and, and that's, uh, that's an important part of my life for me. I have to have that. One other thing, uh, I love to read. I wish I could read more. I, you know, I sort of, I've gone through periods in my life where I'll read like crazy, and then I get so busy I can't finish what I'm reading. And nowadays it's, it's little, but I do like to read about specific things. A lot of it has, to, has some parallels to being a carpenter and working with your hands, but I was a crazy fanatic about the space program. There's a lot of other things like that that I followed. So when I have a chance, I, I'll grab something, and it may take me a long time to get through it, but I still like to do that as well. That's my quiet time. You seem like the guy who can solve any problem. So I'm wondering what the hardest problem you've ever had to solve is. It's not the hardest life lesson. It's, it's just something that I think is really important, especially for what I do sometimes in woodworking and doing carpentry work and the process. And I think I learned this from my father as well. And that's really the hardest thing to do is to learn patience. And by that, I mean, I've had occasions where I'll be working on a woodworking project in the New Yankee Workshop, and I'm on a little bit of a time schedule, and I'm trying to get things done, and I'll set something up on the table saw, and I'll think about it, and I'll say, you know what? This isn't the smartest thing in the world to do. And generally, it's because it probably has a safety implication, and that's that drives me back. So be patient. You know, don't rush it. You're going to pay a price if you rush it. And the biggest challenge, not that I had a lot of times that I crossed the line of being impatient, but I think the most challenging thing to do and learn in the skilled trades and in life is to just be patient. You know, don't jump to conclusions. Don't think if you take a shortcut, it's going to pay off because more than likely it's not going to pay off. So I think that's the biggest challenge. When that occurred, you know, I really had to talk to myself and say, reconsider this because rushing and not being patient. And I always tell people when they say, you know, have you had any serious injuries in the field? And I'll say no. And 
And I've always said not being focused, not being patient is really probably the primary cause of most injuries that people get in this business. And so patients can cross a lot of different areas, and it's not an easy thing to learn, but it is a valuable thing to learn. Thank you for that reminder. I think we can all practice patience in all areas of life, but it is true that haste haste not only makes waste, but it, it frequently results in accidents. That's right. So here's an equally important question, maybe not quite as deep. We, the general public, would really like to know what your main criteria for a norm caliber plaid shirt is. <laughs> you know, I got some criticism. I, I did a little talk at the Builder Show, and I didn't have a plaid shirt on, and the, and the announcer who was introducing me, he um, kind of slapped me on the hand. I, I can't <laughs> believe it. you don't have a plaid shirt on today. And I said, well, you know, I, I have gone through a little period of getting away from them, but <clears throat> they seem to be very po- popular in general when you look at any kinds of catalogs and so forth. But for me, I look at the older ones, and I just had to have a photo done for something, and I picked out one of my old L.L. Bean sort of medium-weight plaid shirts, red, bright, you know. I-, I know what it was. We had a thing we were trying to do for Christmas for the show, the holiday season. So it's usually got to be bright and warm, you know, a little worn, you don't want it to be looking brand new. No, it's got to be comfortable. I mean, it's got to move with you. That's right. I just imagine <laughs> like opening up your closet and it's just like, it's all plaid, like the whole <laughs> thing. <laughs> My wife won't let me throw them away. We have a collection of ones that, that are like not really worth wearing anymore. But I did a segment years ago. I think it was when, might have been when we syndicated some of the New Yankee Workshop shows with DIY or HDTV, and they wanted me to do a little promo. So we we did exactly what you said. We filled the whole closet rod with plaid shirts, and I went in looking a little disheveled and <laughs> like I had just got up out of bed. And I was looking at looking at I'd look at a shirt and go and shake my head. Nah, I'd do another one. Nah, <laughs> and they were all plaid shirts. I mean, they could have all been the same color, and I still would have been trying to decide which one to wear. <laughs> I like that you have a sense of humor, too. (laughs) Where can our listeners go to find out more about Generation Next? If they want to learn more about Generation Next, they can go to thisoldhouse.com, and there'll be a link where you can find out how to apply for the apprenticeships and everything else about the initiative. And if they don't want to do it that way, they can go on Google and just search This Old House, Generation Next, and they'll find out the whole story. Awesome. And what about you? Are you on social media? You know, <laughs> but this old house staff twisted my arm to get me on Twitter like two years ago, and I posted about six times. I am terrible <laughs> at social media, and I apologize for that, but maybe it's just my age. I'm one of those people who always has something going on, whether it's work or not, and it seems like it's not high enough on my priority list. Well, you've got a lot going on, so that totally makes sense. I feel like you've given a lot of yourself already to the public. And so we can give you a pass on the social media. Okay. (laughs) Well, thank you so much. This has been amazing. Yes. Thank you. Yeah. Best of luck to both of you. Thank you. Take care. All right. You too. Oh my God. We just talked to Norm Abram. (laughs) What just happened? I don't know. I don't know. I'm feeling all kinds of feels. <sighs> I, I mean, part of me was really wanting to nerd out with him and just talk woodworking, mm-hmm. you know, and shop talk. But that would have been really boring for you and probably everybody else. Hopefully I'll get to do it one day. I didn't tell him this or you, Jamie, but I have been in the new Yankee workshop. What? Yep. I've been inside it. He wasn't there. Norm wasn't there. Is but that when was, you met I, Russ? Mm-hmm. Is it like... Like, what is it like? Hallowed ground. <laughs> yeah, just tell me where it was. It like, oh. <laughs> you know what I really appreciated about it is you can really see Norm's methodical, analytical, mechanical engineering mind at work. When you see a shop that's got great flow, that's laid out for efficiency, that understands where materials are going to end up and how they need to be moved, 
when your hardware is organized, that means you want to be able to find things quickly. <laughs> and it also means it's a much safer space. But I do think being in the shop and seeing how everything was laid out gave me a window into the mechanics of his mind. It's a very intimate thing. And I feel weird that I was there and he doesn't know I was there. <laughs> you know, I felt like I, I stepped into a piece of history, too. Yeah. I mean, he's been around forever with this old house and New Yankee Workshop. I mean, I remember watching this old house when I was like, I don't know, I must have been like eight. And then Jordan and I used to binge watch New Yankee Workshop. That would be like our Sunday afternoon. We'd be like, what's Norm going to build today? And he was just like influential for us when we were doing DIY, because in our brains, we were always thinking like it has to be done right and you have to wear safety glasses. Like those are the yes. only two things I remember <laughs> from watching everything. <laughs> but you know what I think part of his appeal is he learned that patience from his father. And then when he went on to be on this old house in New York workshop, he embodied that patience for the audience. You know, he stressed what was important and he distilled out the information so that you could understand if you weren't an expert, but he gave you the thinking behind it. I mm -hmm. cannot stand people who just tell you how to do something and don't tell you the thinking behind it because you don't really learn then. Mm -hmm. He's America's shop teacher yeah. for all the kids who didn't have shop class. And he's the patient father for all the people who didn't have that kind of relationship or didn't have a handy father. And I don't want him to ever go away. I know. <laughs> I know. I really connected with this Generation Next initiative when I was at the IBS show. I was able to learn more about it. And I really feel like with Design Milk, we talk so much about the design and the architects and, you know, the end result, but we have to bring skilled laborers into this equation, right? They're part of this ecosystem and they're just as important as the person who decided what something should look like or how the tile should get laid out or what the roof should look like and what materials should be used. I mean, they're incredibly important because you're only as good as your best contractor at the end of the day. Am I right? <laughs> Yes, you are right. And I'm going to go even one step further. Well, first of all, if you're a designer or an architect or in any way involved in the manufacture of three-dimensional objects or, or products, if you're not making them yourself, you're going to be relying on skilled labor to get them executed. And so in that regard, yeah, you're only as good as your best contractor, your best subcontractor. But I also think Norm touched on something that I believe so deep in my core, which is that you become a better designer, a better architect, a better thinker, thinker, mm -hmm. when you know how to manipulate materials and, you know, the physics of how things work and how things get built. And so even if you don't think that you're going to end up becoming a skilled laborer, going into the trades at all, but you still log a few summers doing it or do an apprenticeship, it will improve your life. Even if you go into accounting, it makes you a better problem solver. It makes you have more agency over the material world and your own domicile. Mm -hmm. I can't even tell you how important I think it is for everyone, but especially anyone who wants to go into any aspect of the design field. You'll be so much better at what you do if you have some hands-on experience with the skilled labor. Yeah, I agree with that. And I think it's really important. You know, we, we talked a little bit about the importance of having business classes alongside design classes, but I also think it's important to have those hands-on experiences too, to have a shop class or to have the opportunity to use, you know, woodworking tools or even like 3D printers or just anything you can get your hands on to figure out how something gets created. I think it's it's super important. And I think it's like, you know, between the design thinking classes, the business classes and the hands on classes, it's like a trifecta of, of what you need to be a good designer. I agree with you, but I, I think it's what you need to be a good problem solver. And I think it's what that problem solving is what we need in all aspects of industry. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And we're preaching to the choir. <laughs> I know. But. I know. One thing I just wanted to mention really quick that he said, too, was he mentioned men and women. And mm -hmm. it's so important to me to make sure that, like, my daughter knows she could be whatever she wants to be. Right. And one time she's five. One time we were um, we saw a woman and she and she was a police officer. And my daughter turned to me and said, oh, my gosh, women can be police officers. <gasps> and I was like, at five. 
five, she already thinks it's a man's job. And I hated her saying that. I was so frustrated. And I was like, of course they can. But like, you know, I knew a girl who went to, I went to school with and she became a plumber. And I was like, what? He's a plumber? I'm like, that's a dude's job. But then I realized like, why should it be? You should be able to be whatever you want to be. And exposing women to the trade and, and trade opportunities is equally as important as exposing it to men. Maybe even more important. Oh, some of the most badass construction managers I've met have been women. Not to say that they're necessarily better than men, but they do have skills for multitasking and being able to appreciate the design elements along with the fabrication elements and the organization and And the timing of everything. Yeah. (laughs) Anyway, the ladies, get your tool belts out. Start doing your tile (laughs) yeah and if you i'll come over and we can do we can build some stuff in your garage with your daughter oh that sounds awesome yeah i'll bring my tools all right maybe it'll be in the new yankee workshop (laughs) 2.0 thank you guys for listening please subscribe on itunes radio public or wherever you get your podcasts and go to cleverpodcast.com to read the show notes learn more about norm and see images of his work while you're there, sign up for our newsletter so you never miss an episode. You can also connect with us on Twitter, Instagram, and Facebook at Clever Podcast. We love getting your feedback. It really does keep us going, you guys. This episode of Clever was edited by Chris Modal of Your Studio with music by L1011.